I started flying. I had to work to keep from dying, especially since I came to Vietnam. Seems on every combat sortie, that's when Charlie tries to sort me. When I'm shooting guns and dropping bombs. Ladies and gentlemen, please give me a standing ovation for Colonel ja Joseph Haas Milligan, a true American hero. Haas, welcome. Thank you. We don't have a lot of room, I tell you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to talk with this microphone in my hand because fighter pilots have to have both hands. To, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Bar Barry said I had 45 minutes to talk to you tonight, but if, after that uh, group photo session, I think I've only got about 10 minutes left. But um, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll, get, we'll give it a try here anyway. Uh, I was going to talk to you last night about uh, flying on Robin Old Swing, so. I saved that uh, for, for tonight. And uh, I'm just going to talk about one, one mission uh, flying with him, and that was the day I got shot down, um, because that was a very historic mission. It was uh, May 20th, 1967, and the uh, target for that day was the Kep Railroad Yards on the northeast railroad uh, going from Hanoi into into uh, China and if you look at the map back there around the corner of Southeast Asia and find Hanoi on the map you'll see see there is a northeast railroad that goes up into China and a northwest railroad that goes up into China so uh, Kep was about 40 miles uh, northeast of Hanoi it was the main marshalling yard on that that uh, railroad so therefore that's a very important choke point uh, we had uh, about a hundred um, aircraft involved in that mission that day not not all uh, direct combat uh, aircraft but we had uh, a uh, gag I guess it's fair to call it a gaggle of uh, f-105 fighter bombers out of Karat and another gaggle uh, out of uh, Tok Li, both, both uh, Thai bases, uh, that were attacking the target that day, and they both had with them uh, usually eight uh, F-105F wild weasel airplanes for SAM, surface air missile suppression. Uh, my role in that was I was at the 433rd TAC Fighter Squadron at Ubon Air Base, Thailand. And we provided, for my squadron, eight F-4s to provide MIG-CAP protection against the MIGs for the fighter bombers going in and coming back out. We had uh, probably at least eight KC-135 tankers that we hooked up uh, with uh, on the way in. and. For everybody but me on the way back out, um, out over the uh, Gulf of Tonkin, uh, over over in the uh, South China Sea. So, and then and then a a, a lot of uh, other various air, airplanes, uh, some of which I know you've all seen come in and out of out of NKP uh, uh, while you were there. You're probably wondering what some of them did. I always wondered what some of them did too, but. <laughs> But in, in, in any big mission like that, there's an awful lot of different, did I lose my mic? A, a lot of different uh, airplanes doing a lot of different things in support. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to um, 
tell you uh, kind of an overview of the mission and, and then get into some more details. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to be able to describe the entire mission to you because it, uh, I was involved in a dogfight. That's how I got shot down. Uh, the dogfight lasted it for 15 minutes. And as far as we know, that's still considered the longest dogfight in the history of jet aviation. Uh, you imagine uh, F-4s in and out of afterburners for 15 minutes over enemy territory, and yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a long time. And uh, what, what we ran into that day were 32 MiG-17s. Okay? So um, it, it was a historic mission, uh, not only for the length of, of the dogfight, but it was also one of the most successful dogfights in, in the Vietnam War. Uh, there, there were seven MiG-17s shot down that day by our F-4s. Not a single F-105 bomber was lost. The only airplane that was lost that day was mine. Okay. And it, it, uh, it pains uh, any self-respecting uh, fighter pilot like me to stand up before for a group and admit that I got shot down by an enemy airplane, but, but I did. Um, the, it was an historic mission also because of some of the people involved. Um, we had uh, two flights of uh, four each, uh, F-4s, um, providing MIGCAP, uh, ballot flight, was led by uh, one of our flight commanders in our squadron, um, Phil, Major Phil Combies. And uh, his backseat pilot, Lieutenant uh, Dan Lafferty, who happened to be my, my roommate at, at Umban, Thailand. Um, they were up at the uh, front of the F-105s going in on target. Um, I was in the second flight of F-4s at the very tail end of the force, and our flight was being led by our wing commander, none other than Robin Olds, Colonel Robin Olds. Uh, Rob, Robin was a uh, World War II ace, had 12 kills in World War II. Uh, he had four more that he admitted to. We all knew he had, had more than that but four that he admitted to uh, for officially 16 kills in his career, so a triple ace. Robin described that dogfight as, you know, remember this is coming from a triple ace, Robin described that dogfight as the most intense dogfight he had ever been in. He says it was just a bunch of F-4s and MiG-17s going round and round in a circle. He says it was like a, an old-fashioned World War II Wifferdill. And he said uh, he learned one, one lesson on that, that, that dogfight. It's not probably a good idea to attack 16 MiGs with four F-4s. Well, well R Robin had a propensity in not always getting all the facts straight straight, those of us that knew him well, and, and, the, and the truth was it was worse than he said. It was, was four F-4s attacking 32 MiG-17s. The MiGs were armed with guns. We were not at that point in the war. All we, were, all we had were missiles. We had four uh, Sparrow missiles, which are radar-guided, and we had four heat-seeking missiles, sidewinders. Okay. And in order to shoot an enemy aircraft down with a missile, you have to have at least a mile separation. Uh, because once the uh, missile falls off the rail, the engine has to ignite, the missile has to get up to speed, it has to stabilize, and then it has to acquire the target. And at the air speeds, and altitudes we were flying, that takes at least a mile. And as Robin described, 
This was an old-fashioned World War II type of dogfight. We were close in. We had no more than 350 yards separation between us and the, and the MiGs, or vice versa. And so our, we had no guns. Our missiles were pretty much useless. Well, they were useless at that range. So um, on the way into Target, the uh, Phil Combi's leading ballot flight radioed that he had spotted some MiGs, but they were too far out. He was 20, 20 miles ahead of us at the front of the force. So he said that he would uh, leave, leave them for, for uh, Tampa flight. That was my flight. And so I immediately had my head down the cockpit in, in the radar scope looking for those MiGs. Uh, I never could find them. Turns out the reason was because we were right on top of them. I was looking out 20 miles where Phil Commies was and not close in. <clears throat> that was the last radio call I heard on that, that mission. I didn't, it never uh, dawned on me why at the time because we, we, track, uh, we practice strict radio discipline in, in the air. You know, you don't talk unless there's something to talk about. And uh, so I didn't, didn't even think of, give it a second thought, but the reason I never heard another radio call is because we lost the radio in my airplane. And you can't fight a dogfight with an F-4 without a radio because you can't clear your own six o'clock position. So you're relying upon your wingman to, to clear your six o'clock and vice versa. Um, I, could, I couldn't find the MiGs on the radar, so I lifted my head up. And just as I, I lifted my head up, here we are flying right through the middle of the whole, whole bunch of them. Um, they were flying in uh, two separate uh, circles of 16 MiGs each, one at, at uh, 14,000 feet, which is the altitude we were running in at, and uh, a second circle of MiGs, uh, 16 MiGs uh, that were down on the deck. Um, one of the radio calls that I didn't hear came from our number three uh, aircraft piloted by uh, Captain Bob Pardo, uh, who was in my squadron. Um, Bob uh, told Robin Olds he spotted some eggs that were a threat to the 105s, and Robin told him, go get them. And so three and four broke off from our, our, our two airplanes leading two. Um, and that, that left uh, just two, two F-4s to attack the 16 MiGs at, at our altitude. And so when I pick, put, picked my head up, that's what I saw. Robin Olds flying right through the middle of 16 MiGs with me on, me on his wing. And um, the procedure in a dogfight is the leader always attacks the enemy. It's the job of the wingman to, to protect the tail of the leader. And, and then you might change places uh, in a prolonged dogfight. So Robin attacked two MiGs, and he immediately had two MiGs on his tail. And again, 350 yards separation. The two MiGs on his tail had started to fire 23 millimeters at him. They had him absolutely bracketed. He was a dead man walking at that time. He was about to get shot down. Uh, my aircraft commander, Major Jack Van Loon, said, Haas, can you get a lock on? on those MiGs, and I said, no, they're too darn close. And he said, well, we've got to do something or we're about to lose our leader. And I said, roger that. And so we uh, slid out wide and angled back in and did the only thing we could do, which was to fire a Sparrow missile across the, the bow of the two MiGs on Robin's tail with the hope that would scare them off, and it worked. Um, when those MiGs saw that, that missile go right across their nose, they literally broke down hard and left and headed for the hills. They wanted nothing to do 
with a dogfight with an F-4. So for a brief moment, I'm watching our Sparrow missile go ballistic over the horizon because it's not guiding on anything. So it's, it's uh, being affected by the force of gravity just f following the curvature of the Earth and trailing a long trail of white smoke behind it. And right on its tail was a Russian heat-seeking atoll missile. Now that got my attention. And I craned my head around as far as I could, looked behind me, and there were two MiG-17s on our tail. And a, a uh, heat-seeking missile will guide on the hottest thing it sees. And that should have been my tailpipe. It should have gone up my tailpipe and killed me. Instead, when that Sparrow missile dropped off of the rails, it was, its engine was an instantaneous hot spot that was hotter than the tailpipe, and so that Russian heat-seeking missile guided on that Sparrow missile instead of going up my tailpipe. And what do you think the odds of that? Are? Well, you can't, you can't calculate the odds of something like that happening. That, that's something you, you don't see. I, I still have that picture imprinted in my, my brain of one missile chasing another over the horizon. That's just something you never, never see. And uh, if you talk to anybody that's been in any kind of combat, whether it's in the air or on the ground, they'll tell you that that combat is chaotic. It, it makes no difference how well you're trained, and U.S. military members are the best, best trained military force in the world were then and still are. And I don't care how good you think you are, and we thought we were really good, none, none of that makes any difference in, in combat. You know, some days you just get lucky. And if the Golden BB has your name on it, well, it's going to hit you. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And apparently, it, the Golden BB didn't have my, it's, have my name on it that, that day. But that's, uh, you, you, can't, you can't explain how something like that happened. But that was just one brief moment in that good dog fight. Now we got two MiGs on our tail. Robin's free and clear, and he's still attacking his two MiGs. But we've got two on our tail. They started firing their 23 millimeters at us, which, which we can identify because they're red tracers. And they had us bracketed. So, we went into a 4G climbing turn, and MiG-17s don't have the power to stick with an Air Force and an F-4 doing that. And we quickly uh, outmaneuvered those two MiGs. They were they just stalled out uh, below us, so they were no longer a threat. Uh, at the top of the uh, turn, I looked at the airspeed indicator, and we were down to 250 knots, which is not a good good thing in a dogfight. And I, t I told, uh, told Jack, uh, watch your airspeed, and he started to push the nose over to, to uh, gain some energy back, but it was too late because here's two more MiGs diving on us from a two o'clock position with their uh, 37 millimeters blazing, and we identify those because they're yellow tracers. And we turned hard into them to try to get them to overshoot, but uh, uh, they were able to uh, hit, hit uh, the main fuel tank right behind my seat with two shells. And I could uh, both feel the thump thump of the shells hit, and I could hear the thump thump of the shells hit. And Jack said, uh, Hoss, we've been hit. And I said, I know it. And he, he said, uh, my stick is frozen, so I just instinctively grabbed my stick and I said, mine's frozen too. He says, we're going to have to get out, and I said goodbye, and I pulled the handle. Just that quick. Now, Jack was a grizzled old uh, F-100 uh, pilot, had been in TAC for, for uh, over half his career at that point in time, and, and uh, he had uh, many discussions with the, with the young lieutenant impressing upon him, me, um, that if we ever get hit, 
And if the air, airplane isn't flying, you've got no business being in it. As he says, he had too many friends that uh, got hit and hoped that it would think, things would get better, and it never does, and they ended up riding an airplane in. So when he told me, we're going to have to get out, I didn't hesitate. I just immediately pulled the handle. And the last thing I saw before I went up the canopy rail, uh, uh, up the, the seat rails, was two more MiGs diving on us from our 10 o'clock, also firing their 37 millimeters. Now, there's been a lot written about um, this dogfight and how many MiGs there were and how badly we were out, outnumbered. And, and some say 10 to 1, some say 20 to 1. You know, it's not like I was sitting there with a checklist on my knee <laughs> checking it. Yeah, there is, there's me, there, yeah. there are two over there. No, no, no. <laughs> Now, I wasn't counting them, but, but what I do know is Robin Olds attacked two. There were two on his tail, that's four. Two on my tail, that's six. Two coming from two o'clock firing, that's eight. And two coming from 10 o'clock firing, that's 10. So I was definitely outnumbered 10 to one. I was in a, a big circular dog fight with 10 MiGs all at one time. So as Robin said, that was, that was pretty darn intense. So um, Jack and I both both uh, bailed out. Uh, we were side by side in the chute going going down. Um, my my airplane uh, since since we took a hit right in in the main fuel tank, my airplane was just a great big fireball, and I ejected right through the fireball, and I got uh, seriously burned. Jack was lucky because he was in the front seat a little further forward, so he went up over the fireball and didn't get injured. Um, and, and I'll come back to, back to those injuries uh, in a bit. Uh, but while Jack and I are floating down side by side in the parachute, here come two more MiGs from our right on a gunning pass trying to shoot us right out of our chutes. And, uh, Going all the way back to the days of World War One, that, that's against all the rules of chivalry. You just you just don't do that. But that's what they were doing. Fortunately, our number three airplane, Bob Pardo, had had spotted them, and he was on the tail of those two MiGs and chased them off of us. And uh, when Bob Pardo went by, he was so close to me, went right across in front of me. I waved to him as he went by, and he rocked his wings in acknowledgement. And that's the last I saw, saw Bob for about 10 years. I mean, I spent the next six years as a POW, but, but uh, 10 years later from when I was shot down, I was at Randolph Air Force Base in uh, San Antonio, Texas at a reunion, and Bob was there, spotted me, came running up to me, threw his arms around me, gave me a great big hug. Then he back, let go and backed off and said, Hoss, you crazy SOB, why did you wave to me? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I told him I just wanted to let him know I was okay. Well, being okay was a matter of perspective because I, I guarantee you I was a long ways from okay at that, that moment, but I was, I was alive. Um, so the, the, the final tally, you know, was uh, seven, seven of those MiGs were shot down with only the loss of, of uh, one of four that, that goes down as one of the maybe, maybe two most successful uh, dogfights in the history of the Vietnam War. The other one being Operation Bolo, which I know uh, asking you last night, many of you have heard about that, which was led by Robin Olds as, as well, in which they they bagged seven uh, MiG-21s one day without the loss of a single F-4. Um, now, I want to I want to uh, switch gears a moment, and uh, uh, I, if I, I could uh, talk for an hour just trying to describe all the details of this dogfight, and I'm not going to do that. But I, I want to talk to you uh, 
and now about uh, some of the challenges we faced in the POW camps in North Vietnam. And the, the uh, conditions we faced were, were uh, really miserable. We, we were tortured, we were beaten more than once. Uh, th that went on for, for years. We faced injuries, we faced disease. For the most part, there was no medical attention. We did not get enough to eat. We did not get enough to drink. We were locked in, in filthy little, little cells. Uh, hygiene was essentially non-existent. Our latrine facilities were a rusty bucket in the corner of the cell. We had rats that would crawl in at night and chew on chew the dead skin off of our feet. We, the food we got, even though it wasn't enough, was wasn't very good. Um, we sometimes our food was laced with rat turds or cockroaches. You ate it anyway because it's all you had. In the winter time, we did not have sufficient clothing to uh, protect us from the cold. Uh, temperatures would get down to about 40 degrees at night in Hanoi. And if you're not getting enough to eat, you're not generating much body heat. And we had very little in, in terms of clothing. And so sometimes we would have to pace the cell all night long just to keep from freezing to death. But that was a picnic compared with the summer times. The summer times were absolutely brutal. We, we had the sun beating down on those brick-lined cells all day long. And uh, then the bricks would radiate, continue to radiate the heat all night. And, uh, the temperature in the cell didn't become livable until about dawn and the sun came up and it just repeated the same thing over and over again. And we, uh, we estimated that the temperature in those cells would get as high as 140 degrees. And when you're not getting enough to drink and there's no relief from it, um, 140 degrees is about at the uh, physiological limit of human survival without any relief. So we were truly on the, on the edge of survival uh, for months on end in the summertime. Our bodies would get covered with heat rash. Uh, we were susceptible to uh, fungal infections and again, no, no medical treatment. So you, you, you just look at that as a background of, of what we were facing in survival. But then you go back to the days that we were shot down, like myself, and the injuries that we had, to, that we suffered when we were shot down, captured, and tortured. And you put all that, all that other stuff on top of our injuries, and it's miraculous that we survived at all. The uh, survival rate of the POWs in North Vietnam was about 90%. And if you, if you go back to your history books and see what the survival rate was in, in other wars, now, it wasn't very good in other wars, but 90% of us came out of there alive, which, which is just incredible. Um, I, I want to give you a little bit of perspective of exactly what the injuries are like. And so I'm going to, I'm not going to tell you any secondhand stories. I've got a lot of secondhand stories of talking to other prisoners that I live with. But I'm just going to tell you about five POWs uh, that I lived with, including myself, um, to give you some idea of the types of injuries. Uh, about two weeks after I was shot down, I was placed in a cell with four other prisoners. There were, there were just five of us. They put us together because we all had such serious injuries. I guess they were hoping we'd take care of each other because they sure as heck weren't going to take care of us. Uh, the senior ranking officer in our group was uh, 
uh, Navy Lieutenant Commander Red McDaniel. He was an, an A-6 pilot. And when he was shot down, he broke two vertebrae in his back. And uh, when, when he ejected, he also uh, mangled his left leg uh, getting out of the airplane. And when he was captured, he was severely tortured and had his uh, right arm pretty much uh, mangled. And when Red came walking into the cell where the other four of us were waiting, he had this ashen gray look on his face. He was all hunched over from the, from the uh, broken vertebrae in his back. And he was walking with one leg dragging his mangled left leg behind him and, and his right arm just hanging useless. And when we saw him, he looked just like a zombie coming in there. We couldn't believe the condition that he was in. And we told him that. I mean, he saw this, this wide-eyed, open-mouthed look on our faces, you know, what's wrong? And, and we, we told him. God, you look like death warmed over. And Red looked around the rest of us and said, you all look that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was an eye-opener, I'll tell you. Well, um, another one of our cellmates was a Navy lieutenant junior grade, that's equivalent of an Air Force first lieutenant, um, Bill Metzger. Bill was an F-8 pilot. And uh, he was involved in a dogfight, shot down two MiGs. Unfortunately, uh, right after that, he got hit by AAA, and the gun camera went down with his airplane, and so he never had any confirmation of the two kills that he got. But uh, when, when Bill's aircraft was hit by AAA, it, it hit right in the cockpit, and he ended up with a, a two-pound piece of shrapnel in his uh, left thigh that cut his uh, thigh open all the way to the bone, a deep gash all the way from the knee to the hip. Um, he got no medical attention for that. Broke his right femur, clean, clean break. Got, got no medical attention for that. And uh, both arms were just riddled with uh, pieces of shrapnel. And the Vietnamese were so convinced that Bill would never survive that they didn't even issue him clothing for a year. He laid, laid in his bed naked for a year. And you just try to imagine, how, how do you keep somebody alive like that when you have no medical uh, capabilities at your disposal in the type of environment that we were in with the type of treatment that we were receiving. That is a real, real challenge, a real challenge. Um, another uh, member of our group was uh, Air Force Major uh, Tom St Sterling. Tom was uh, an electronic warfare officer in the back seat of an F-105F wild weasel airplane. And when Tom ejected, when his aircraft was hit, and he injected from that uh, F-105, the uh, edge of the seat uh, caught him right under the thighs and snapped both both legs, both both femurs. Um, one one was a compact compound fracture. Tom Tom was lucky. He was one of the few people to get medical attention. They when they captured him, they took him right to the hospital in Hanoi, and they uh, performed surgery on his uh, two femurs, inserted uh, titanium pins, and uh, he, uh, he, he healed up after it. it. was a long, long healing process. He was bedridden uh, for quite some time. And one interesting note was that Tom said when he was laying in that hospital bed in, in Hanoi, the door to uh, the room he was in was open, and he could see uh, the doctor outside the room uh, explaining to his guard that uh, he was supposed to get two glasses of milk a day, 
to help with the healing process of the bone. Well, something got lost in translation because for the next month, the only thing Tom ever got to eat or drink was two glasses of milk a day and no, no other water or food. So it's, a, it's amazing. He, even though he got medical attention, it's amazing he survived. Um, then, then there was me. And I, of the five of us, I was the only walking wounded. Everybody else was bedridden. And I, as I said, I ejected through a fireball and I got third degree burns 360 degrees around each forearm from the wrist to the elbow. Okay. And I also had a first and second degree burns on my face and the back of my, my neck. Well, when I hit the ground and uh, got rid of my parachute and got out the uh, medical kit out of my survival vest and pulled out the little instruction booklet that's in there and I was looking for how do you treat burns well, the word burn isn't in that, that instructional book. Can you imagine that? You, know, you all know the Air Force song, right? Says something about you go down in flames? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whoever, whoever wrote that uh, little booklet, I guess, never heard that song. And, and so there was, there was nothing in there to, to use. Um, I, I got... I, um, let me backtrack a minute. I want to come back to the burns, but um, when I uh, hit the ground, I, I, w I went down over an 8,000 foot tall mountain range. And I didn't really relish the thought of going down in the, in the trees because the jungle canopy in Southeast Asia, you know, was as high as 300 feet tall in some places. And so I, I was uh, looking for a place to land and I spotted a clearing on, on uh, one of the mountain peaks. And the, of course, these are coarse mountains, weren't, which aren't the nicest things to land on anyway. But um, I, I found this small clearing, which was really no bigger than this area right here in front of the podium. And so I was slipping um, my, uh, my risers all the way down. And just before I hit the ground, it became apparent to me I was going to land right dead smack into the center of that clearing. And it made me so darn proud of myself, I totally forgot all about doing the parachute landing fall. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I just hit in a heck of a heap. And, and it was a slight downslope, so my right leg took the full brunt of the impact. And I, uh, and years later, the doctors confirmed what my injury was, I suffered a complete tear of both the medial and the lateral collateral ligaments in, in my right knee. And it was explained to me by the flight surgeons that that was the injury that ended Joe Namath's career with the New York Jets. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the kind of injury if you get on a football field, you don't get up and walk off. They cart you out, out in a gurney. And so I, uh, I was explaining this to the flight surgeons, you know, six years later when they're examining me, and, and they, they asked me, so what did you do? And I said, what do you mean, what did I do? And I said, well, I, I got up and they had bayonets in my back, and they forced me to climb down this mountain. The flight surgeon said, but you can't do that. <laughs> and I said, oh, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, oh, I do still remember the thought that went through my head when I had those bayonets poked in my back. I'm not ready to die. I'm not going to die. And so I climbed down that mountain on my own accord. Then I went on a forced march the rest of the night. The flight surgeon said, but you can't do that. Yeah, it's, um, combat's a strange situation. You, there's things you can't, you can't explain, you know. And I, I'm, you can ask me any question you want, but you can't ask me how, how I did it, because I just don't know. I just know that I did. Um, and then I got to Hanoi, 
and uh, I got tortured. And I had ropes uh, tied around my my elbow, my uh, my arms just above the elbow, and the elbows tied together behind my back. I had uh, metal clamps put over my ankles, and a rope went from the the elbows behind my back up over my shoulder and down between my legs and around the metal clamps and then they just cinched me up as tight as they could which forced my elbows that are tied together behind my back to rotate up above my head and the human anatomy is not designed for that to happen and so I ended up uh, dislocating both shoulders and that's extremely uh, painful thing to endure. Um, they left the ropes on me too long, so I ended up with with uh, bilateral ulnar neuropathy, which is means I su suffered damage to the uh, nerve that that uh, uh, goes goes across your elbow. That's that's the one that if you hit your elbow on something, it, you know, it causes it causes your funny bone to. The tingle, yeah. So um, I suffered uh, uh, ulnar nerve damage, and I had pins and needles in the palms of my hand and and uh, some of my fingers for close to a year thereafter before uh, they finally healed up some. Um, but now back back to the the burns. During torture, I got rolled around the dirt. The burns, uh, my burned arms got uh, badly uh, infected. And uh, it got to the point where one day a guard opened my door and he walked in with a handkerchief over his nose because I smelled so bad. I didn't smell it because I was living with it every day, but, but my arms were just crusted over and uh, constantly oozing all kinds of different colored fluids, just the ugliest things you want to see. And I realized at that point in time I might, might be in a lot of trouble here because the, that infection goes systemic, I'm dead. And I remembered something that was taught in survival Air Force Survival School at Stead Air Force Base but back in 1965. And I could have sworn I slept through most of those lectures, but apparently there, I, I remembered one that may have saved my life. And that was if you're in a combat situation and you have, you have wounds and don't have access to medical attention, let the flies get at the wounds. And I did. And there was no shortage of flies in Vietnam. Uh, they, they laid their eggs on my wounds. They hatched out into almost microscopic, uh, tiny little larvae and they immediately went to work on, on those wounds. And the nice thing about maggots is, if there is anything nice about maggots, is that they do not eat dead, uh, live flesh, they only eat the dead flesh. And they did a fantastic job of cleaning those wounds. And when they were done, my, my, both of my forearms were just this bright, perfectly clean, smooth, glistening pink. Just a fabulous job. Well, but but before I reached that point, you know, it, the every day the the mass of maggots on each of my forearms just kept getting bigger and bigger until I just had these two big wiggling bulbs on each forearm. And the um, the uh, next uh, uh, step in the process of using maggot therapy for burns is you have, have to flush them off with sterile fluid. Now picture yourself in the environment I'm in and where am I getting sterile fluid from? Urine. You bet, Mid, midstream urine. Right. And so I use midstream urine. When, when I thought those maggots were done, I, I used midstream urine to flush them off. And so, somebody asked me one time, well, how did you know they were done? I said, well, I was born and raised on a dairy farm in New Jersey. I've seen many dairy cows that have gone, gone through barbed wire fences trying to get to the apple orchard and, and uh, had, had maggots uh, in their wounds. And so I, I know when a maggot's done when I see one. So, uh, 
<clears throat> that, that was not an issue. Somebody also asked me one time, well, when you went to sleep at night, how did you keep from knocking the maggots off? I had to think about that, and I said, you know, that's a really good question, but, but the truth is, I, I laid on my back with my elbows propped against my sides, holding my arms up all night long. And my cellmates said that when I went to sleep, they said I was asleep, but I never once dropped my arms. The power of the, power of the mind, you know. Amazing what you can do in, in situations that uh, require something extraordinary in order to survive. All right, so. The final stage, once I've flushed those maggots off in, in, in uh, treating those wounds, is you're supposed to wrap the wounds with clean white cotton cloth. Well, where am I getting that from? Uh, and particularly since when I was captured, they stripped me of all my clothing, except for one article. They didn't take my Batman t-shirt. And, <laughs> And that's, that's another story if you want to hear that later. <laughs> but I, I still had my Batman, Batman t-shirt. I always wore it when I flew for, for good luck. And, and again, I've been asked, well, did it give you good luck? And I said, sometimes I'm not sure about that, but I'm here today to talk to you. So I guess it did. So I ripped that t-shirt up in the strips, wrapped my arms with it, and uh, it, it took over six months, but I, my arms eventually healed. And if I go to, to a, uh, a uh, dermatologist today that hasn't seen me before, and they examine me, and they look at my arms, and the first thing they'll say is, oh, you've been burned. Yes, sir, I have. Well, that's, that's probably the best job of skin grafting I've ever seen. And I say, nope, maggots. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So, um, that, so that's four of us. There's one more. The uh, fifth member of our, our five-man crew was uh, Navy Lieutenant Junior Grade uh, Gary Anderson, who was a radar observer in the backseat of an F-4B. And um, he didn't get injured on, on shoot down or captured, but he got injured quite badly in, in the torture. And uh, they left shackles on his legs for, for too long, and he suffered uh, 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 serious uh, tissue damage to his ankles that, that got infected. But, but the thing that bothered him the most was the fact that he was hit in the side of the head with a rifle butt during torture and it ru ruptured an eardrum. And uh, that, uh, that eardrum got, uh, that ear got infected and the eardrum healed back, to, scabbed over. And next thing you know, he's got pus building up in the ear, pressure, pressure in there. And, and that, that, that's, you know, a type of pain that might be as tough as anything, anything you, know, you could experience in, in torture. It's just maddening, it won't go away. And um, he, he finally couldn't take it any longer and, and we were scrounging around, we found an old rusty nail and he took that rusty nail and jabbed it in his ear and rebroke his eardrum to release the pressure and so all that. Uh, this is a great, great conversation right after dinner, right now. I'm so, uh, I just realized that I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, so, so he's he's got this pus, you know, coming out of his out of his ear, and uh, I'm I'm sitting there looking at that and thinking, and and I I said to him, Gary, you know, peeing on my arms works so well. <laughs> Yeah, I, I offered to pee. I offered to pee in his ear. <laughs> he would. He would have no more. He would not hear. He would not hear about that. <laughs> but that 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 gives you just. I know. I may 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 have put a little humor on this, but just just imagine those types of injuries. No medical attention available to you, 
in, in the conditions that we were living in and the way we are being, being mistreated. And how does 90% of us survive? Well, there's, there's a lot of answers to that. Um, the communication networks that we had in those prison camps uh, were just phenomenal. We had prison grapevines like you wouldn't believe. So we were able to communicate with each other. We conducted ourselves as a military organization. We, we, we knew the chain of commands and, and we adhered to them. We had orders of the day. And then there's a lot of faith and hope. Faith in God was just so important. You know the saying about there are no atheists in foxholes? Yeah. There weren't any in Hanoi Hilton either. Oh yeah, there, there are a few, few people shot down as atheists, but they didn't come out of there as atheists. Yeah, yeah. And then, then the faith in your fellow man, faith, faith in our country. We all knew that our country had a long history of we don't lose, leave anybody behind. And that hope was just, a, just an incredible factor in, in our being able to survive getting by one, one day to the next. And, and you heard, heard what I said last night about the Sante raid and, and, and what that meant to us. So, tough conditions. We're there a long time, longer than any other group of Americans had ever been uh, uh, in incarcerated. And, and, and no group has been incarcerated that long since. And yet we came home with our heads held high, came home with our honor, Well, I think I've talked long enough. Uh, thank you for having me, but I would like to entertain uh, questions. And uh, I'll tell you right up front, there's no, there's no subject that's off the table. You can, you can ask me anything. It won't bother me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know what to tell you. Thank you. Welcome. Well, there was a guy named Bud Day who went through that. Yes. Tell me you don't know him. I know him. There was a fellow named John McCain. Yes, I know him. And we'd like to hear a little about him. Yeah. Well, um, I was in the same prison camp that John McCain was in. I uh, never lived in a cell with him, but I was close to him. I communicated with him. And um, I, I know in running for office, uh, there, there have been, uh, uh, he was called, called once a loser for being, be, being captured. I guarantee you John McCain was no loser. Um, he was uh, accused of, of uh, being treated uh, differently than the rest of us. Absolutely not. He went, the same, went through the same thing and all the rest of us went, went through. He probably had it harder because of who he was, because of who his uh, father and his grandfather were. So, yeah, just fine, fine, and but but day, yeah, fine, fine gentleman, yeah, real heroes, yeah, and an inspiration, especially to young lieutenants like me. <laughs> yes, sir, back there. Oh, Mayor Craft Commander, yeah, Jack Van Loan. Yeah, he did not. Uh, he did not get injured like I did, and uh, I mean, he got beat up pretty bad during torture. But yeah, he was uh, when we we were together when we were captured uh, up on top of that mountain, and uh, we were trapped by uh, uh, captured by uh, indigenous uh, tribes people, not not Vietnamese. These are. Uh, some kind of tribes people that lived up in the mountains. And uh, one group took him down one side of the mountain and the other group took me down the other side uh, because there was a bounty on her head and, 
and and uh, that bounty would feed feed a village uh, for decades. And so, two groups each wanted to get their bounty, so they separated us, and so they could each each collect. Yes, sir. They're, and they uh, were going to court martial them, but one guy committed suicide, so they decided not to court, court martial them. I've never heard that story. Uh, that's probably not true. Okay. However, let me address the enlisted uh, uh, part of that question, though. Um, we were mostly uh, uh, air crew members. Uh, that, that, that were uh, being held captive most of the war in North Vietnam. Um, so we were a collection of pilots and navigators and, and EWOs and radar observers and, and the like. And uh, since we were, since we were uh, aviators, uh, we, we uh, had at least two years of, of college. Uh, two years is all the Navy required. Air Force required for a four-year uh, degree, and that meant we were we were officers, uh, the bulk of us, and that meant that, and not not because we were an officer per se or uh, had a college education per se, but but uh, that combination meant we were a little older than the average GI when we were captured, and and uh, that. Uh, probably had some effect on our ability to survive the way we, we did. Um, but there were some enlisted men, and for the bulk of the war, uh, there were only four enlisted men in North Vietnam. Three of those were Air Force pararescue personnel. Okay. The fourth was a Navy seaman uh, named Doug Hegdell. And Doug uh, was serving on a destroyer off the coast of, of uh, North Vietnam. And he went uh, topside one night uh, and did, for a smoke break, didn't realize that the, uh, car uh, the destroyer was going to start shelling the coast. And when those big guns on that that uh, destroyer fired, the concussion blew Doug Hegdell overboard. There's, there's no light out there in that ocean, none, unless there was a moon, moonlight, and there was none. Pitch black in the ocean by himself with, with, without a life vest or life raft, he tread water for 10 hours before he was picked up by a North Vietnamese fishing boat. How many of you think he could have done that? Tread water for 10 hours, yeah. I, I couldn't have done it. I, w I wouldn't have survived that, I guarantee you. But he did, yeah, incredible. But the, the uh, four enlisted folks, um, in terms of rank, they were, they were at the bottom of the list amongst a whole bunch of officers, but that did not in any way affect uh, their performance or affect the way that the rest of us looked at them. We were all part of one organization, all one band of brothers, all working together to help each other survive. And, and uh, they were as much a hero as anybody else. They went, they went through what everybody else went through. They endured, they came home. They, they deserve any accolades they got. And in fact, um, uh, the three uh, Air Force pararescue men were, were given uh, battlefield commissions by our senior ranking officer in Hanoi at the time. And, and uh, when, when they returned home, President Richard Nixon confirmed those battlefield promotions. 
Oh, well, yeah, 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 sure. Well, Doug, Doug was a, Doug was a mystery to the North Vietnamese. I mean, they couldn't understand what the heck he was doing out there in the water. I mean, he's an 18 year old kid and, and working in the bowels of a destroyer, you know nothing about nothing, right? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> And, and they tortured him, and there's no, nothing worse than being court, tortured for something you don't know, and he knew nothing. He, he couldn't answer their question. And, and at first they thought that uh, he was a CIA plant, yeah, right? <laughs> trying, to, trying to infiltrate their, their country. Uh, but they finally came to, to believe that, that he was nuts, you know? <laughs> And, uh, and, and he, he helped them think that way. But, but um, Doug was, I guess it was about 1968, 69, he was, he was uh, offered an opportunity for early release and the Vietnamese were doing that for propaganda purposes and, and uh, I was in that prison camp uh, with, with Doug at the time that that occurred. And of course, our our orders were no, no, we don't do that. We don't cooperate. Nobody goes home early. Uh, there's only one way we're leaving this this country: first in, first out. And and we we held by that. Uh, I was offered early release. I just laughed at them. You know, so did so did almost everybody else. There were. A few people that accepted early release against direct military orders. And to this day, the rest of us aren't very happy with them. And they're not part of our Vietnam Association. But in Doug's case, he was ordered to accept early release. And we coached him with the names of all known POWs in Hanoi at the time, yep. And so he came out with with the with the names, and when he and when he did, that was the first indication that many of us were alive. Yep, yep. Dumb Doug wasn't dumb. He was not Doug. Dumb. Nope. And 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 he ended he ended up uh, uh, teaching at the Naval Survival, Navy Survival School. Uh, for many years after his after release. What's the end of the story? Though? What's that? Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, <laughs> yep, that, that's right. We, we, he, uh, in order for him to memorize those names, we had to teach him in a sing song fashion, Old MacDonald. Yeah. Yeah. To the tune of Old MacDonald. Yeah. So when he got uh, that, Right. And the Defense Department and CIA, everybody's oh hysterical, you know. So yep. he goes, Old McDonald, and he's singing along. He said, uh, turns out I know Navy first. I guess that was because Yeah, I think Yeah, the first th the first thing they did was gave him uh, pen and paper and said, Write them down and he says, I can't do that. I have to sing it. Yeah, sing it anytime that you want and you can still sing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a little, little more background on, on that. Um, they moved us around a lot in the prison camps. I was, I was in uh, seven different prison camps in six years. Uh, and, and some of those prison camps I was in more than once. I was in the zoo twice, the Hanoi Hilton three times. So yeah, incredible amount of time they, uh, they moved us around. Um, and as a result, we would, uh, eventually learn the names of everybody that was in all the, all the prison camps. And some, some people had better memories than, than others, and, and I, I did. I mean, that's, I guess because I went to Rutgers, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but but, uh, but I, I, had a good me I had a good memory, and I was one of the ones that, that uh, memorized the names. And, 
I, I remembered, uh, you know, first and last name, rank, branch of military service, airplane shot down in, and off of which uh, Navy carrier or which, or from which uh, Air Force base. And I memorized them alphabetically by last name. And I just practice it over and over and over again in my head. And uh, every night before I fell asleep, I would re recite the whole, whole list until I fell asleep. And so I was in a position, along with some other folks, to uh, feed those names to, to uh, Doug Hegdell. And I wasn't the one that taught him to sing song. That was, <laughs> that, that was a, a cellmate of his name, Air, Air Force Lieutenant uh, Joe Krekka, that uh, taught him that. But, but yeah, I had, when, when, I, when I, I finally got released, I, I had a, a list of, uh, I think it was about 585 names. Okay. And uh, I was on the uh, second release that came out, so not everybody's name was necessarily known. Uh, we weren't taking any chances, so when I got released and uh, sat down with in Intel, they started asking me a lot of questions, and I says, time out. Before you do anything else, I need to do a data dump of the names of everybody that was in Hanoi. Because I've been carrying it in my head too darn long, I wanted, I literally wanted to dump, <laughs> clean, clear my brain of it, and so I, and so I did. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yes, sir, over here. Yeah, yeah. Um, we 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 saw that whole firefight. I said that last night. You know, we were in the flat plains when Sante raid took place, and I, w I was in Camp Faith, so that was like five clicks away, pretty close, and could see the whole firefight. Had no idea what it was, and then uh, the next morning we walked out of our cells and saw these uh, paper cutouts of uh, helicopters hanging from tree limbs. We still had no idea what took place, but they uh, they took us uh, uh, all of us out of Camp Faith and and all the other outlying prison camps, took us back to the Hanoi Hilton, and put us into a section of that prison that had large cells uh, that were designed to hold forty or fifty prisoners. Uh, they they had used those cells for for uh, Asian Asian prisoners, uh, and boy, they had a collection of people. Uh, some were Chinese, some North Vietnamese, some South Vietnamese, Thais. A lot of a lot of, and some of them uh, I suspect were real criminals, and some were political prisoners. But they would put them in those big cells in groups of 100 to 120. And uh, they cleaned out all those big cells from the Asian prisoners, I don't know where they took them all, uh, to, to be able to accommodate the Americans. Uh, with the exception of one cell, and that was cell number one. And uh, they, they still had uh, about 120 uh, Asian prisoners in cell number one. I was in cell number two, and separating cell number one and cell number two was a toilet. Uh, the old uh, French style squat toilets, if you know what I mean, okay? A little hole with footholds to sit on, yeah. And that, that was, the Hanoi Hilton was built by the French, and so it's not, not surprising they had that kind of a toilet. And cell number one had a similar one on the other side of the wall. And we could reach, and there was a, there was a window uh, uh, in that little cubby hole that, that, uh, where that toilet was. And we could reach our arm out the, uh, out the window and around a corner and touch hands with the Asian prisoners in cell number one. 
Well, we immediately uh, started trying to uh, communicate with these guys. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't told this story very often because nobody ever asks this, this kind of question, but um, I could say they were an interesting collection of people. And none of them spoke English, but they did speak parts of other languages. And, and there were some of them that spoke, spoke uh, uh, French, not, not, maybe not too surprising, um, German, Russian, Spanish, Thai. And in the 40 people in my cell in, in uh, room four, we, we had people that could speak all those languages too. I, I, at the, I had taken uh, two Thai language courses at Ubon before I was, I was shot down and I was speaking pretty good Thai. I, I probably remember a lesson that I know some of you guys <laughs> know, but, but um, so we would write notes to these guys. We would write out a note on toilet paper and the Vietnamese toilet paper was, you know, a sheet about yay big. Not what you might consider to be toilet paper. This wasn't tissue. This was really coarse grade of paper. But we would uh, write notes on, the, we would compose a note in English. And, and then we would translate it to all those other languages. You, and we'd have to use the whole collection of languages to come up with all the words to translate the English note into something else. And then we would hand that, and if, we, and if there was a word we, we couldn't translate to another language, well then we'd draw a picture of something. But we would hand these notes through the window to the Asians, and then they would get together in their cell and, and translate it. Back, back into Vietnamese. And, and then they would write an answer, translating it into the collection of languages. And so we uh, established a very regular uh, note writing session with these guys. And uh, one of the things we found out, and I'm, I'm going to answer your question pretty soon. <laughs> Um, one of the things we found out that these guys weren't getting enough to eat. Now they they would send them out at two weeks at a time on a work on a work detail, and uh, working working their butts off, and they they just weren't getting enough to eat. And so uh, we started uh, giving them some of our bread as a reward for communicating with us. And they're the ones that told us about the Sante raid because they were out on the work detail when it happened and they knew, they knew exactly what happened and they wrote us a note. And, and uh, I, I remember that note, it had pictures of helicopters and bombs exploding and <laughs> yeah, trying to get to, to the point. And so that, that's, that's how we learned. And it was about two weeks after we got to the Hanoi Hilton before we finally found out that, that the Sante raid had taking place. And, and then uh, going forward, these, these guys would come back with a lot of intelligence about what was happening in, in North Vietnam and defensive structures and things. And I don't know what we're supposed to do with it. <laughs> but but we, we, we learned a lot. Any, any other questions? Uh, yes. Sir. No, I was not married at the time, and I'm, I'm glad I wasn't. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, were you there when Jane Fonda came through and it was true that they were, she was handed papers with uh, names of the prisoners? Yes, I was there, and no, that is not true. That's an internet lie. Okay, and when things like that get in the internet, you can't ever get rid of it. But no, that never happened. That doesn't mean she was a good person. She was not. Question all the way back. I'm sorry, I can't hear that. How did you endure inside the prison? How did you use humor? Why, your, your, 
How did we, uh, yeah, did where did we find our humor in uniform? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, um, we, uh, we did find things to, to laugh, laugh about. And, uh, and when we did, we, using our communication system, we would send little funny stories around to other people. I mean, there's, there's funny things that, that happen. And, and uh, let, let me just give you one, one example. Um, the uh, Vietnamese forced us to bow to them whenever we uh, uh, greeted them. So if a guard opened a door, we were forced, we were forced to uh, do a full length bow to them, okay? And when they closed the door, the same, same thing. If you went to an interrogation, you had to do a full length bow to the interrogator. And we didn't like, like that. That was part of their brainwashing at, attempts against us. And uh, so I was in a cell with three other prisoners, four of us, and uh, we were getting tired of that. And the guards did not speak English. And, and so uh, whenever we bowed to them, we would say, we, we would say, F you. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to, in the interest of decorum, I'm not going to say the word, but we, we, would, say, we would say F you. Well, that went, that went on for a while and made us happy. But then one day, the guard came to the cell and, and uh, gave me a wrist chop signal, which meant put on your long sleeve shirt and long pants, you're going to an interrogation. And I w we were four lieutenants in that cell. By data rank, I was the senior ranking one. That's why I got pulled out. They did not recognize our rank or data rank unless they wanted something. So I went to an interrogation, and the interrogator, English-speaking interrogator said, my guard reports to me that you are being impolite to him. And I said, no, that's, that can't be true. We, we would never do that. And he said, mm, mm, no, my guard reports to me you're being impolite. Well, I'd been there long enough and, and listened to propaganda, communist propaganda so long that I, I learned how to throw it back in their face and saving face was a big deal for these, these people. And, and so I, I told him, uh, we would never be impolite to your guard because your guard is an instrument of the Vietnamese people, the very people that provide us the clothes on our back, the, the roof over our head, the food in our bellies. It's the, it's the uh, humane and lenient treatment of the wonderful Vietnamese people that allows us to be alive today. So how could I ever be impolite to your guard? Well, this just blows that guy's mind, you know, because you know, he, he, he wants so bad to have an excuse to beat the crap out of me. That's, that's why I was there. And I, I wasn't giving him that excuse. And, but he kept repeating, my guard would not lie to me. And finally I said, you know, I think I understand the problem. I said, your guard doesn't understand English, does he? No. You, on the other hand, have an excellent comprehension of the English language. And got, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, and you know that there are certain words and phrases in the English language that sound very much alike, that your guard would never understand, but you would. And he said, yes. And I said, we are so appreciative of your guard and the humane and lenient treatment that we're receiving from the Vietnamese people that when we bow to him, we're saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I, and I said, you can, you can see how, how your guard would confuse F you and thank you, but you on the other hand know exactly what I'm saying. He said, ah, yes, yes. I, good. I will inform my guard that you were saying thank you to him. You may return to your cell. So I, I got up off my, my stool. I did a full length bow to the interrogator and said, F you. 
and he said, you're welcome. <laughs> so, um, so, so yes, there was humor in uniform, and, and when something like that happened, we'd, we'd tap on the wall, and it'd spread all around the whole camp, and everybody got a, got a big kick out of it. And, uh, Sir, when, yeah. did, when did you uh, hear the first rumor or fact that you were going to be released? Oh, okay. Um, officially, officially, yeah. through their channel. Yeah, um, when, the, when the bombing uh, started up again in, in uh, North Vietnam, you know, the peace negotiations were going on and um, they weren't going very well. And so Nixon ordered the bombing to resume. They took uh, half of us at the time, about 200 of us, and evacuated us out of Hanoi and took us uh, 100 miles north to the Chinese border to a little prison camp there in the Karst Mountains called Cao Bang. And we were there for about a year, I guess, and um, one day uh, the guards came, and, and we've got no news up there, right, no news. One day the guard came to our, our uh, prison building and opened up all the cells and opened the door to the building and let us out. And so 200 prisoners all all out and we were wondering what the heck's going on and the guards just got this sad look on their face and their heads down and they just walk away. Well this went on for three days and finally our SRO uh, requested a meeting with with an English speaking officer and he asked him what's going on? I mean why do your guards, why the sad looks and why did they open their doors and just walk away? And, and the interrogator said, oh, haven't you heard? Yeah, right, haven't we heard? Yeah, he said, the B-52s bombed Hanoi, and we fired everything we've got at them. We have nothing left. We no longer have the means to exist. You have won the war. That, yes, you won't find that in print anywhere. No, but that's, but that's what happened, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions here, I guess. Uh, after the raid, did they treat you better, the prisoners, if any at all? Uh, oh, after the Sante raid? Yes, after the raid, if any, in any way say, oh, we can be penetrated here and... Yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the, uh, the treatment had actually started improving before that. Uh, when Ho Chi Minh died in in I guess September of 69, um, a change of regime, regimes, and uh, they started treating us. Uh, 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 well, time to go home. All right, <laughs> all right, and, and and so yeah, so treatment had already started to improve, but the biggest impact of the Sante raid is it put the entire prison population into one spot in, in a, a group of rooms in communication with each other in the Hanoi Hilton. And, and uh, yeah, that, that, that did more for morale than anything else. Yeah, the second question yeah. here is some of the movies that were made, like Hanoi Hilton and yeah. all that, I've never watched them really except flipping through the channels and all that. When they made those movies, did they interview any of the POWs or? Yes, did yes, they, they did. Any, they is most of that factual? I mean, yeah, yeah, the very, very factual, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. interesting. That's yeah, good yeah, enough. yeah, yeah. And, and by, the, by the way, one of those films uh, uh, received a, uh, uh, an Academy Award. I, I think it was called Return with Honor. I, there we go. There we go. Yeah, I think it's. it's I think it was called Return with Honor. It received an Academy Award for something, uh, but but that film was never shown in U.S. movie theaters because because the uh, U.S. movie in, industry would not allow it. Yeah. I think it's called Return with Honor. Yep. Yes, sir. Sir, when did you get sprung? When? Uh, February. When did you get sprung? 
Fe February 18th, 1973. <laughs> Any other questions before we go to bed? One last one here. <laughs> yes. Uh, did you, were you in a prison population with uh, Ed Leonard? Yes, I was, yeah. Okay, because he was an NKP flyer. Yeah. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. NKP. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, I think he was from the 602nd, if I remember right. Mm. Okay. But 68, 67, I don't remember for sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. Was there, I, I read that there were 17 people from Laos released. Is that true? Uh, there, there were. I, I don't know the number, uh, but, but yeah, there were uh, a number of uh, prisoners that were captured in Laos. Uh, there were uh, a number, mostly enlisted, that were uh, captured in South Vietnam and transported north. Uh, there were also several that that uh, strayed across the border into China and shot down and held captive by the Chinese until the end of the war, they were also released. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you brother. That was inspiring. Thank you for your service. Thank you for giving your life to this country and the inspiration to bring to others because of your story.